1 Corinthians chapter 15. Follow along with me. I want to begin reading in verse 1. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, that is, some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain." Father, we thank you today that indeed grace is not in vain. That indeed, Father, as we come today, we come because of grace. Father, it is your grace that pursued us. It is your grace that caught us. It is your grace that changed us. It is your grace that is changing us. It is your grace that continues to work in our life. And Father, it is your grace that will take us all the way home. As we continue for one more week to explore what we believe, Lord, I pray that you would give us an understanding, wisdom, and the ability to apply and live the doctrine of the church. Help us to understand what it means to be a part of the church. Help us to understand what it means to be the church for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me begin this morning with a confession. You know, there are a lot of things I could confess, some of them more serious than others, but let me confess this. I still prefer to buy and listen to CDs, compact discs. I'm not real crazy about the digital music craze. I'm just not. Maybe it's because I'm, I'm old and set in my ways. But I, I still like CDs. I remember 1983 when Sony put out the first CDP 101 iconic CD music player, $1,000, seriously, and music changed. Next thing you know, a whole revolution begins. Although it took a couple years to catch on, in May of 1985, Dire Straits released on CD Brothers at Arms. And boy, nothing was ever the same. The neat thing about CD music is that every now and then, you would go to buy what you've been anticipating being released, and you get it, and lo and behold, there's a sticker on the CD, and it said, bonus track. It had not been advertised. You didn't know it was going to be there. And there's an extra track on it. It usually wasn't that great, but every now and then the bonus track turned out to be pretty decent. Now, you're wondering, what in the world does that have to do with anything? Well, it has as much to do with the fact that in DVD releases now, or then, you would every now and then get these extra features, these extra bonuses, and you'd think, wow, man, I, I can learn more about the movie, and I'll have a greater understanding of plots and characters and all those things. Pastor, what does that have to do with what you're doing today? Today, you're getting a bonus feature. My prayer is it's going to be one of the good ones and not one of those meh features. Month of April, we have been looking at the Apostles' Creed. You may, you may, it may not have sunk in that 
You know what? The pastor's actually preaching the Apostles' Creed to us. We're Baptists. We don't have any creed but Christ, right? Oh, no, no. We, we have a creed. Uh, what do you mean we have a creed? creed? Creed just means I believe. The word creed from the Latin credo means I believe. So when you say you have a creed, you're saying this is what I believe. What we've been doing in the month of April is using 1 Corinthians 15 to look at the Apostles' Creed and what the Apostles' Creed summarizes concerning the person and work of Christ. We saw the person of Christ and we saw the work of Christ broken down into the fact that we believe in the crucifixion, the death of Jesus. We believe that He conquered death. That is, He was raised again. We believe that He's coming again. That's what we've been looking at. And my intention was to use that as a bridge to begin a new series today in the book of Titus. Uh, what instead I've chosen to do and want to do is to actually give us a transition into Titus. When we get to the book of Titus next week, we'll be in Titus through the summer. The book of Titus is a book that I'm using deliberately, specifically to address something that we really need to look at, and that is church, church leadership, and what does the Bible teach and say about how the church is to be led. But before we get to that, I thought, man, it would be really good if we could transition into that. So what better way to transition into that than to go right back to the creed, because if you look at the Apostles' Creed, there is a line in there about, of all things, the church. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. So what I want to do is I want us to look at that this morning. And again, we're going to look at it through the lens of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And also we're looking at it through the bridge of that same song that started all of this. I, the thing that inspired me for this was the Newsboy song, We Believe, which is uh, their modern version or rendition of the Apostles' Creed. In, these, in this time of desperation when all we know is doubt and fear, there is one true foundation we believe. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe. Well, in the bridge of that song, there is this neat little line that I want you to note. As that song bridges uh, from the last stanza into the chorus one more time, the bridge has these words. Let the lost be found and the dead be raised in the here and now. Let love invade. Let the church live loud. Our God, we will say, we believe. We believe. So I got to thinking just for a moment. I know that's a dangerous thing. But this would be a good place for a bonus feature. No extra cost to you. And hopefully this will benefit you. Since I've already publicly lamented that I'm not doing a complete series on the Apostles' Creed. And I've already had a couple people address an issue that the Apostles' Creed addresses, and they've asked me, would I address that? This was not one of them, but I said, why not? So let's address this one particular issue, because it's hard for me to pass up such a magnificent line like, let the church live loud. What does it mean for the church to live loud? That line, let the church be loud, live loud, is... The contemporary take on, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. So why not? So let's look at this this morning. This, what I believe to be a logical transition from the person and work of Jesus Christ to the consequence of that work. The consequence of the work of Jesus is indeed the body of Christ. It is the church. And since our next series uh, is going to be through Paul's letter to Titus, which is one of the pastoral letters, which is a letter that centers on church leadership and centers on the responsibility of leaders of the church to the church proper. This gives us the opportunity to transition into that. Specifically, what is the church? And why do we believe in the church? Indeed, if we live in times of desperation, if, if we really believe that our life 
to a large extent, is surrounded by doubts and fears. And if there really is one foundation that you can rest your life on, and that foundation is God the Father, made known to us through God the Son in His life, death, resurrection, and the reality that He's coming back again, if all of that is true, and it is, then we should believe in the church. And the church should live loud. 1 Corinthians 15. I've really come to appreciate 1 Corinthians, uh, not just this 15th chapter, which is a really powerful chapter, but the entirety of the letter. This letter to the church at Corinth may very well be the most difficult letter that Paul had to write for the simple fact that it required Paul to have to correct so much error in that church. If you really grasp the book of 1 Corinthians, if you understand what Paul is doing in that letter, then you understand that that church had a lot of problems. They had significant theological error that was driving behavioral error, error, which points out something important to, to grasp. It really does matter what you believe. It really matters what you believe about God. It matters about what you believe about Jesus. It matters what you understand salvation to be and how it works. It really matters because all of that drives how you live. That is, doctrine, what you believe, really does dictate behavior, how you live. When you find somebody who doesn't live consistent with what they say they believe... There's a problem somewhere. And the problem more than likely stems from the fact that they don't really grasp what they say they believe. So it's really important how we understand the church and we understand what the church really is. This letter shows the heart of the Apostle Paul. It shows his love for the church. His love for that church specifically but his love for the church in general. Because Paul understood what the church really was. So let me suggest to you this morning, Paul believed in the church. And he believed the church should live loud. Now, don't let that throw you. I'm not talking living... Listen, a church living loud doesn't mean they get together and make a lot of noise with anthem rock worship. And lots of racket. That's not what living loud is. That's not what it means. That's not what is implied by the creed itself. But the church should live loud. And the the, the stronger you believe what you believe, the louder your life will be perceived to be. If indeed what you believe is affecting how you live, you will be living loud, even though you're quiet as a church mouse. So Paul believes in the church. We should believe in the church. Let me show you that we can see Paul's belief in the church in three ways. Number one, we see Paul and his belief in the church in his explanation of the founder of the church. His explanation of the founder of the church. By the founder of the church, I mean Jesus Christ. Where where do we see that? Well, we've been seeing that throughout the month of April. We've seen it in the last four weeks in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. I delivered to you that which was given to me, that which saves you and is saving you, if you stand on it, unless you believe in vain. And this is what I gave you, that Christ, the person of Christ, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that he died, just as the scriptures said that he would. That he was buried. And that he rose again the third day, just as the scriptures said that he would. What Paul gives us in verses 3 and 4 there is nothing less than an explanation of the founder, the person and work of Jesus Christ. We can justly, rightly identify Jesus under the banner of the founder of the church. After all, did Jesus not tell his disciples that he would build his church? 
what do you call the builder of the church? The one who said, listen, here's my conception about what I want to see become a reality. That, that's the founder of something. Well, that's what Jesus is. He is the founder of the church. Back in Matthew chapter 16, let me show you something because we really need to grasp this. There are mistakes made with this passage. But this passage is Jesus' own commentary on what it means to be the founder of the church, which Paul puts forth in 1 Corinthians 15 under the banner of the gospel. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. In the midst of Jesus' ministry, he comes into Caesarea Philippi. And uh, the, the disciples have been out and about in the world, in Jerusalem. So Jesus asked them a question. This is a teaching moment, a teaching session, if you would. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? Guys, just, just tell me. You're out and about. You talk to people. When you're walking up and down the aisles of Walmart and you get stopped by people that you know, and they engage you in conversation, I know they're talking about me. What are they saying about me? Who do they think that I am? Peter spoke on behalf of the disciples. Some say you're John the Baptist. They think John the Baptist has come back to life and you're him. Some think that you are Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. What was it about Jesus that made him look like, sound like, act like, be perceived as being an Old Testament prophet? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ. Jesus said, yeah, I hear all of that, but you tell me, what do you think? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered him and said, Simon, son of John, you are one blessed man. Let me tell you why. You didn't figure that out on your own. You didn't. My father revealed that to you. And I tell you, Simon, you are Peter, Petros. And on this rock, Petra. I will build my church, and hell will not be able to stop it. Note two things. I will build my church, my ecclesia, to call out the called out ones. It was used in Jewish culture of, of an assembly. It was actually used in Greek culture as well, of a, a public assembly. Our English word church actually comes from the Scottish word kirk, which is... Not that same thing. But the church is God calling out, Jesus calling out to himself an assembly of people who will become his representative, his people. I am going to build my church. And upon this rock is what this church will be built upon. The question is, what rock? What does he mean upon this rock? Well, some say that the rock is the disciple named Peter. The name Peter is the Greek word Petros, which translated is the word rock. So yeah, in a very real way, Jesus changed Peter's name from Simon to Rocky. Seriously. Some think, well, that's what we're talking about. That's what Jesus meant, that Jesus was going to build the church upon the first leader who would be Peter, who would be the first Pope, and that's upon whom ultimate authority comes through. I mean, how much plainer can it be than Jesus saying, here you are, Peter, and upon this rock, here you are, Petros, and upon this rock, this Petra, I will build my church. Pretty clear, right? Not so fast. Yes, the word rock is used twice, but it's in different forms. Some will say that the rock is not Peter at all. That the rock goes back to Jesus. And that the rock is actually the confession that Peter makes concerning Jesus. Which would make the rock the person and work of Christ. Yes, you are Petros, you are Peter. And based upon what you've just confessed, the God-given revelation of who I am... I'm going to build my church. The church is not Peter. It's not built upon Peter. The church is built upon the person and work of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus is the rock from which we are hewn. That's what we actually see in this passage. Jesus actually calls him out as Simon. He doesn't call him out as Peter. He calls him out as Simon. And then puns or does a wordplay on his name. My father has revealed something to you, Petros. And we're going to build on the Petra. We're going to build upon me, the Christ, the divine Messiah. That is, a, is what the church will stand upon. That is what the church is. So the rock is not Peter per se. The rock is rather Peter's confession of Christ, God-given revelation of who Jesus is, the person and work of Jesus. Listen, Paul understands all of that, which is why we have what we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He understands what the church is. He understands it's not built on a man. It's built on the God man. He understands what the church is to be, which is why he believes in the church. Even an imperfect, problematic, fragmented church like Corinth. Yes, Corinth. That's Corinth. The church at Corinth from the book of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, if you really pay attention to it, you can't help but come out that, man, this church has a lot of problems. It's far from perfect. And man, you talk about fragmentation. They got groups within groups and cliques within cliques. Guess what? The church has always been problematic. The church has always been imperfect. The church has always been fragmented. There is no greater fragmentation of the church in the world and history than the American church. But that doesn't mean that you throw the church out. That doesn't mean that you have the liberty now to say, you know what, I can do the God thing on my own. I don't need those hypocrites in that church down the street. Actually, you do. You most certainly do. If indeed the church is what Jesus says that it is, and you want to go it apart from the church, you really are going it alone. You need the church. You should believe in the church. Paul certainly believed in the church. We see it in his explanation of the founder of the church. He rightly understands the rock upon which we are built. Secondly, you can see Paul's belief in the church, and therefore you should believe in the church. We see it in Paul's expression of the foundation of the church. You say, wait a minute, I thought you said Jesus is the foundation. No, I said Jesus is the founder. Here's the foundation. In this passage that we've been working through, we have Paul giving us the summation of the gospel in verses 3 and 4. Beginning in verse 5, he talks about the confirmation of the resurrection with all the appearances post-resurrection to others. Concluding, when he gets to verse 8, with these words. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. And then listen to what Paul says about himself. He says, For I am the least of the apostles. I am unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not in vain. Now, why am I calling this particular statement the foundation of the church? Jesus is the founder of the church. The foundation of the church, according to Scripture, is the apostles. They are the foundation. Now, let me explain that to you. The church is founded by Jesus, but He calls and Scripture calls the apostles the foundation. Which is why Paul says in this verse, I am the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be an apostle. And yet I am an apostle. You, make sure you catch that. Paul is saying, listen, I'm not worthy of this, but since I am this, I want you to understand the way I understand it. I'm the least worthy of all of this. And here's why. Because I tried to destroy the very foundation that I now am. I tried to destroy the church of God. 
Ephesians chapter 2, we have confirmation of that from Paul. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, Paul writes to the Ephesian Christians. And if you recall, Ephesians chapter 2, we have that magnificent statement about what we used to be and what we are now because of the grace of God. And the fact that now, because of that, there are, there's no longer Jew or Gentile. The wall has been broken down. We, we, we're now one. Then verse 19, you are no longer strangers and aliens. He's talking about these Ephesian believers, which is a predominantly Gentile church. He says of the Gentiles and Ephesians, you're not strangers, you're not aliens. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, that is in Christ, you are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You, you catch that? You are being built. The church is being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone that holds it all together. Well, doesn't that make Jesus the foundation? Yes, he's part of the foundation. He is the cornerstone that holds it all together. But what is he holding together? He's holding together the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, which ties together the relevance and importance of the Old Testament and the New Testament into one, showing God has always had one people. One. There are not two different groups of God's people. There's one group of God's people. They're brought together the foundation of the apostles and prophets upon which you and I are being built. We continue in the line that began way back when God called his first people, we could rightly say probably Abram, and he called out a people, the descendants of Abram, all the nations would be blessed in him, which would ultimately find its fulfillment in Jesus. That's who we are, built on that foundation. Now, again, Paul tells us a little bit about himself being an apostle, and here's what he says. He says, I am the least of the apostles. I am not worthy to be called an apostle because of what I did. I'm the least. And yet, <laughs> look what God did with the least. Now, let me clarify something for you. Uh, this has become a bit of a problem in the day and age in which we live. Apostle. Let me clarify something about what it means to be an apostle. Let me just say this first off. If you're driving down a highway and you see this big sign of a man or a man and his, woman, uh, his wife advertising a church and they're calling themselves the apostle, don't even bother. There is no such thing as an apostle today. You say, well, why not? Because the apostles in the New Testament were a unique historical phenomenon. They were unique. There's only been one group of apostles. And when that group of apostles passed away, there were no more apostles. There would not be a need for the apostles because leadership of the church took on a different form, which is going to segue us into Titus. And we're going to talk about how that developed historically. An apostle, the word apostle, our English word apostle is just a transliteration of the Greek word apostolos. Apostolos means to be sent, or one who is sent with a message. In the New Testament, the word is used in two different ways, in a general way and in a specific way. In the general way, it's used a very minimal number of times as a reference to somebody who's been sent as a messenger. And quite often, it's translated as messenger. But you would see the word apostolos behind it. It's just a general word which means one who's been sent. But when the word is used of a specific group of men, it's being used not generally, but specifically. And when it's used that way, it's being used technically as an office under Jesus. By that I mean the apostles, capital A, apostles, were this unique group of followers of Jesus who were set apart by Jesus for a specific purpose. They were going to be sent ones as well, but their being sent with a message was unique in history. You say, well, listen, I thought those guys were disciples. Well, they were, but they became apostles. If you happen to, to be with us in our studies on Luke on Wednesday night, somewhere, I don't know, 20 years or so ago, it seems like, but actually it was only two or three years ago, 
In Luke chapter 9, Jesus sent out his disciples, and they came back. And in that context, we find out he was going to send out 72 disciples. I thought there were 12 disciples. What do you mean 72 disciples? We, we have a distinction being made. Disciple. The word disciple, we could have a capital D disciple or a little d disciple. A little d disciple was anybody who attached themselves to Jesus to learn. The big D disciples were this group of 12. But the 12 big D disciples became the 12 capital A apostles. The sent ones. This group of apostles. The 12 pre-crucifixion apostles are going to become the 11 post-crucifixion apostles, and they are unique in history. They would never be repeated for the simple fact that you cannot repeat what they experienced and lived. The apostles, capital A, were the first messengers of the gospel after the death and resurrection of Jesus. They are the ones who are the foundation of the church. The church is built upon Christ the cornerstone, and those apostles, the tw- well, yeah, we can still call them the 12, even though... Judas is not one of them. The twelfth was replaced, Matthias, in in Acts chapter 1. Paul was also an apostle. But that group of apostles is the foundation of the church. What they taught becomes the essence and substance of what the church is. Now, the thing that qualified them to be an apostle is the fact that, number one, they were personal witnesses of the resurrected Jesus. In order to be an apostle, you had to have witnessed the resurrected Jesus. And they all did. Paul did. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. Paul asked the question as the church at Corinth is challenging whether or not he's even an apostle. Paul will make the statement, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul's response demands an affirmative answer. Yes, he is an apostle. Yes, he has seen the risen Lord Jesus. Those men were personal witnesses of the resurrected Christ. No one today can claim that. Well, let me rephrase that. They can claim it, but we know better. It doesn't mean you've seen him by faith. It means you saw him. Secondly, they were explicitly chosen by the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, they had the ability to perform signs and wonders. Acts chapter 2, verse 43, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. The apostles all performed confirming signs and wonders. That's the thing that attracts so many people today to want to be called an apostle because they want to put on a show. If you're going to see somebody put on a show under the banner of the gospel, don't bother. You don't need the gospel to be a show stopper. The gospel itself is all you need. The apostles were uniquely chosen. They were uniquely qualified to lay the foundation of the church. And 2,000 years later, you and I, guess what we're doing? We're building on that very same foundation. We are building on their foundation. We are building on the message of the gospel that they proclaimed because that is the message that we proclaim. That is the significance of Paul's references to the apostles here in this passage. Paul says, I'm, listen, I'm not worthy to be included in this group. I worked to destroy that group. I rejected everything they stood for. I despised that group. I despised the church of God. I, I, just, I hated the way. So I tried to destroy it. I tried to destroy them. So what changed, Paul? Paul, what happened? Why are you now working to build what you were trying to destroy. Paul's answer is in verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. You know what Paul means here with these words, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You know what he means? He means that I am an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ in spite of myself that the grace of God was greater than all my sin. It means that he's a witness to the resurrected Lord Jesus. It means that he encountered the gospel of Jesus Christ. It means that he was specifically chosen by the Holy Spirit. It means that he is part of the very group, the church of God, that he tried to destroy. Guess what? Only God can do that. 
That is a God thing. Only grace can do that. And here's why you ought to be ecstatic to hear that. Do you know why you are here? Grace did that. You're here by the grace of God. Why are you not some gangster out in the world killing people and just doing what you want to do, living like you want to live? Well, the grace of God is why. Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. Paul, me too. You too. The grace of God. Listen, that's the answer. The church is the model of what it means to be graced by God. So, when you are a part of a church and you choose to be disconnected, you know what you're really doing? You're unplugging from the very source of grace that changed your life. If indeed it changed your life. Listen, we have such a defective understanding of church today. Well, you know, church is down the road where I go. It's that building there. No, no, no. Church is you. And you're the church everywhere you go. And you're preaching a message every time you speak. And in the choices you make. And in the way you live. Paul believed in the church. My question is, do you believe in it? We see it in his explanation of the founder. It, we understand who we are in Christ. We see it in his expression of the foundation. Knowing that, listen... The church is not something originated from the good old uh, autonomous, pull yourself up by your bootstrap mentality of the modern American. That's not where the church came from, although we have quite a few versions of the church through that filter, unfortunately. Now, the church comes from the founder who is Jesus, built on the foundation of the message of these men. Men whose lives and message we should look very closely at on a regular basis because it's a reminder of who we are as the church. Third thing I want you to see is here's how we know Paul believed in the church. We, believe it, we, we know he believed in it and we should too because of his exposition of the faithful of the church. And here's where I get that. If you notice in, in verses 8 through 10, Paul says, I am the least of the apostles. I'm unworthy to be an apostle because I persecuted what? What do you say? The church of God. All right. Now, back up to the first of this chapter. Verses, I'm sorry, to the front of the book. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I think I got 15 in your notes. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. All right, here in the book of 1 Corinthians... Paul calls the church the church of God. He doesn't call it the church of Christ. He calls it the church of God. Is that important? Well, it just depends. This is a perfect place for me to take a poke at some people <laughs> who say they're not a part of a denomination. They're part of the true church. Why is it the true church? Because we have the Bible name for it. The Church of Christ. See, I could take a shot at that, but I'm not going to. Right? Everybody hear me? Right. All right, if that's the case, then why does Paul call it the Church of God? I know some dear brothers who are part of the denomination called the Church of God. They could make the same argument, couldn't they? I'm not taking a shot at anybody. I'm just pointing out facts. I'm observing the culture. Right? So which is it? Church of Christ or Church of God? Yeah. And much more than that. Church of God, 1 Corinthians 15, 8, 9. Church of God, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. Paul calls it the Church of God at Corinth. 
He doesn't address this to a leader. He doesn't address it to the pastors or deacons. He addresses it to the church, to the people who are the church, the members, those who comprise the church of God there at Corinth. And he describes those that comprise the church this way. He says they are those who, number one, are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Specifically, those words, to be sanctified in Christ Jesus. He calls them, number two, saints. To those called to be saints. So these believers, these Christians are sanctified in Christ. They are called to be saints. Number three, they've joined with all those who on every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So they're joining a group that's much bigger than themselves. My question is, what does Paul mean when he calls believers, sanctified saints, joined with believers everywhere who call on the Lord? What does he mean? Well, simple. He means this. It means you're the church. He means you are the ecclesia that Jesus said he was going to build upon the rock. That's who we are. Well, pastor, which church? In our culture, when you say the word church, well, what comes to mind? Which church? Methodist church? Presbyterian church? Baptist church? Roman church? Church Christ? Church God? Church of God in Christ? Church of God holiness? Church of Christ holiness? Christian church? Mormon church? Church church? Which church? The church. What does he mean by the church? The one that the Apostles' Creed calls the Holy Catholic Church. Ah, that church. Catholic church. No, 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 no. We believe in the Holy Catholic Church. What in the world does that mean? The Apostles' Creed took form after the age of the Apostles up until the beginning of the 5th century. We have that creed developing. We have it in its final form sometimes around the year 400. But it developed over a long period of time. Just before that full development was there, the Council of Nicaea met in 325 to address issues between, on how we understand who Jesus is. And out of the Church of Nicaea, or out of the Council of Nicaea in 325, grew a statement called the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed was then further modified in 381 at the First Council of Constantinople. When you put all of that together, here's what it basically means. We believe in the Holy Catholic Church became, we believe in one Holy Catholic Apostolic Church. So if you are a confessional church, which means you, you hold to a creed and you give this statement of what you believe about the church, then what you are going to be saying is you believe in one holy Catholic apostolic church. Now, I like that statement. You say, Pastor, I don't like that statement. Well, I do like it. And let me explain to you why you should like it as well. And one of my reasons is not because I say so. In that statement, we have a fourfold description of what the New Testament teaches about the church. What we need to do is to rightly understand those four words. One, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. So let me take just a minute here and tell you what these mean. Number one, it means that the church is one. Well, Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter. Uh, 1 verse 2, to the church of God, the one at Corinth, the one church. He will confirm that when he makes the statement that you have joined together with those who believe everywhere. Implying that there is one church. No matter what else you call it, if it preaches the gospel, confesses Christ, and I would add rightly practices baptism and the Lord's Supper as proof and verification of the message, then that's part of the one church. There is one church. By one, I do not mean Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal or Presbyterian or Catholic. I mean the one church. It's not a denomination. It's not non-denominational. And it's not a denomination that claims not to be a denomination. It's the church. The one church. The one true church. That is the one church people of God. The word one highlights unity. The unity of the church. 
You may think, well, that's absurd. There's no unity in the church. We've got all these different beliefs. How in the world can we be a unity? Quite simple. If in all those different hyphenated churches, there are people who genuinely believe the gospel, guess what? They are part of the one church. Do you know when this life is over and eternity begins, how many people of God there will be? One. And I got news for you. If you're waiting to go to church in, in eternity, in heaven, so you can go to Baptist church, you're going to be out of luck. You're going to have to go to the church. It's only going to be one. And by the way, it's going to be everywhere. And you're it. Because you're perpetually dwelling in the presence of God. Isn't that cool? You're not going to have to get dressed to go to church. You're going to already be there. Think about that, those of you who like to skip church so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think of that, those of you who insist you got to have a coat and tie and all that stuff. I'm not putting any of that down or anything. I used to be one of those. Y'all know I've lightened up a little bit. You're not going to have to get dressed to go to church in eternity. You're going to already be dressed. You're going to be clothed in His glory. I got a feeling that's going to be much better than a lot of the ties that I have. And I got a lot of ties. The word one is about unity. No, here we do not have institutional unity. Do you know why we do not have institutional unity in the church today? Because it is full of sinners who insist they know better. That's why we don't have unity. But we do have theological unity in Christ. And when I say that, I don't mean we all believe everything the same way, but the foundation we do. It's not compromised, nor is it compromisable for us. Wherever the gospel is affirmed, there is a confessional spiritual unity that testifies to the one true church, the church of the living God. A oneness that will be visibly realized when Jesus returns. See, we don't see that now. But I believe we're going to. I heard this little ditty a long time ago, never left me. It goes this way, to be one in love with the saints above, oh man, that will be glory. But to be one and grow with the saints below, oh Lord, that's another story. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? It's one church. We believe in one church. We believe in one holy church. The second word, holy. We have it again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus. See, the church is made up of people who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. The church of God, the body of Christ, is sanctified. That's the same word that gives us the word holy. Holy. To be sanctified is to be in the process of being made holy. What does it mean to be holy? Holy at the very core root of the word means to be set apart. It's used of God in the Old Testament. The Hebrew word kadosh means to cut. It's used of God. God is a cut above everything. It's the only attribute of God that is magnified to the superlative. What do I mean by that? What character or trait of God is spoken of in a threefold manner? Repetition in a threefold manner is the Hebrew superlative. Holy. It's not, the Old Testament doesn't say God is love, love, love. It says He is holy, holy, holy. He's different. We are to be different. That comes into English, out of the Greek, hagios, sanctified, saint, holy, all derived from the same word. We are set apart for a specific purpose. That specific purpose is to glorify God in being His people. When John recorded for us the great high priestly prayer of Jesus, John chapter 17, this is the last uh, great prayer of Jesus before He's crucified. In that, Jesus prays for Himself, He prays for His disciples, He prays for the world. In that prayer, He tells us what our real purpose is as believers set apart. John chapter 17, verses 16, 17, and 18, Jesus is praying. He says of his disciples, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 
Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate, I set apart as holy myself, that they also may be sanctified, set apart in truth. What's Jesus praying there for us? He's telling us that we as his disciples are to be a holy people, which means being completely devoted to God and his word. That's what sets us apart. How do you become sanctified? How do you become holy? It's not an experience. It's a life of obedience to the Word of God. Sanctification is the process by which you grow in holiness. In the simplest of terms, to be holy is to not be like the world and the way that it thinks and lives, but rather to embody the Spirit of Christ as you obey the Word. That's what it means to be holy. That's what it means to be sanctified. And that only comes from Christ Himself. So when we say the church is holy, we are recognizing that we are the body of Christ. We are the embodiment of who Christ is. That means the world sees Christ by seeing us. Boy, that's a weight of responsibility for the church, isn't it? How are we doing? Well, in order for the church to embody Christ, the individuals have to embody Him, doesn't it? Which means the weight falls not on the church as a generic word. It falls on you and me as followers of Christ. We believe in one holy church. Unity, holy one holy. Number three, we believe in the one holy Catholic church. Now, Pastor, you're losing me here. Hang on. Paul goes on to write, call to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. The word Catholic is in there. It is. The idea is there. What do I mean by that? When you hear the word Catholic, what do you think of? The Roman Catholic Church, right? That's what you think of. All right, the word Catholic. Big, that, that's what I call big C Catholic. The Roman Catholic Church. There is a little C Catholic. That's the one here. Because the word Catholic actually comes from a Latin word, which means universal. Uh, so when we say we believe in one holy Catholic church, we're saying we believe in one holy universal church. We believe that there is one unified church set apart for the glory of God. And it does not wear the banner of Roman Catholicism. Nor does it wear the banner of Protestantism. It wears the banner of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. That's who the Catholic church really is. Little C Catholic, not big C Catholic. Where is the church? It is everywhere. Now, that in no way diminishes the local church. After all, when you read the book of Acts, you're reading the story of the church. The universal church is made real in time in local churches, in individual churches. We see the visible universal church in the local church. So we, that, that's what we mean. We are part of the Catholic church, not the big C, the little C. You say, Pastor, you shouldn't say we're Catholic Church because that messes people up. Listen, just learn what the word means and it won't mess you up. But if you prefer, say we believe in one holy, universal church. Okay? I would have said that, but that's not what the creeds say. They say, well, we, we, we don't worry about the creeds. Oh, yeah, we, we, we need to know what they say and what they mean. Because you'll have a conversation with somebody one day and you'll think you agree when you don't because you haven't defined your terms. By the way, cults, isms, and schisms do that all the time. That's why you need to know what you believe. We believe in one holy Catholic church. There's one more word. Let's look at it and we're done. We believe in one holy Catholic apostolic church. We believe in an apostolic church. What does that mean? Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Apostolic is rooted in the concept of being an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostolic church is simply a church that preaches the, preaches the message of the original apostles. That's what it means to be apostolic. Now, when the word is used today, 
That's not what's meant. But historically, an, an apostolic church is a church that preaches the message of the gospel, the message of the original apostles. We proclaim the message that Paul proclaimed. We preach the gospel that Peter preached, that John preached, that James preached. We believe the same gospel. We preach the same Jesus. We belong to the same church that Paul preached, that he lived and that he proclaimed, and that he believed in. That's what we mean by an apostolic church. Rightly understood, the church is a unity. It is one it is set apart for the glory of God. It is universal. It's everywhere you go. And it preaches the gospel. That's the church. It's also the communion of saints. The communion of saints simply emphasizes the fellowship of believers. Listen, again, there's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. There are so many people who believe, you know what, I'm a good Christian even though I'm not fellowshipping with anybody, anybody's church. I'm not in any church. I'm just a good Christian. No, you're not. You are a self-described, self-affirming, self-defining Christian, which is so contemporary and so American. You've disconnected from the historic body of Christ. That's not a good thing. It's really not a good thing. Believe in the church and be a part of the church. Well, you know, churches have so much problem. So many problems. Yes, they do, don't they? Again, I'll remind you, there's only one reason why we have so many problems in the church. It's because it's full of sinful people. That's why we have problems in the church. No, no church is perfect. No church is complete. No no church has arrived. But that doesn't make the church any less real, valid, and relevant. Because it most certainly is. In light of that, we need to do what the song exhorts us to do. Let the church live loud. Well, how in the world does the church live loud? Let me tell you how to live loud in this culture. Number one, be a part of one church and be a unity. Don't be a source of discord and fragmentation. Come in Join in, link in, and serve. That will make a loud statement to the world. You know, those folks in those church, that church, they're not perfect, but you know what? They love one another, and they're committed to one another. They're not looking to disown everybody over every little thing. They, they recognize everybody has problems, and they just go ahead and love us anyway. That's loud. You want to live loud? Be holy. What does that mean? Don't be like everybody in the world. Adopt your standards from Scripture. That will live loud in this world. You want to live loud? Link arms with people who may not agree with everything that you agree with, every jot and every tittle of doctrine, but you know what? They are part of the universal church. I don't have any problems worshiping with people who differ a little bit in some of the things that I believe. They don't have to agree with me on every little thing. I'm not going to disown a brother because he errs in one area. If indeed he embraces Jesus and really is a believer. The greatest experience of worship I've ever had in my life was worshiping in a foreign culture with people who didn't even all speak the same language. They didn't come from the same church backgrounds, but they joined together and sang praises to Jesus Christ. I got an idea. Heaven's going to sound a lot like that. You want to live loud? Believe the truth of Scripture. Boy, you talk about countercultural. Stand for something. Hold on to it. And if people knock you down and mock you because of it, so be it. I got news for you. <laughs> they knock Jesus down a little bit. Because of what he believed? Yeah. Because of who he was. But you know what? He lived loud. His life and death is the shout heard around the world. That's called living loud. So let the church live loud. My God, we will proclaim, we believe. Father, we thank you. Father, I thank you for Jesus, the founder of his church. Father, I thank you for the foundation upon which we are built. 
the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, who holds us together. Father, I thank you. I praise you. That by your grace, we are what we are. Father, I thank you for that grace. Father, give us a fresh appreciation and a fresh love for what it means to be the body of Christ, for what it means to be the church, the one holy, universal, apostolic church. In Jesus' name we pray.